Okay, oh. hello everyone. Hi, I'm Lee Hyun Jung, uh, the director of uh, GPRC or Gliopathic Pain Research Center. Today we have a very distinguished uh, uh, scholar as a, a as a speaker, uh, Professor Song Han. Uh, he's currently in the peptide biology laboratory at the Sok Institute for Biological Studies. And Professor Song Han got uh, his uh, bachelor degree in genetic engineering from Gyeongbuk National University in South Korea, and masters in to Tohang University of Science and Technology. And afterwards, he went to the U.S. at the UW or University of Washington at Seattle. He got PhD uh, in neurobiology and behavior. Uh, since then, uh, he uh, went to this uh, uh, before he moved to US, he spent five years for uh, as a research scientist for his military duty. And afterwards, um, at the UW, he, he spent a, a year as a research scientist and postdoc at the program in neuroscience and also a senior fellow and research associate uh, and before he become an assistant professor at the renowned Sok Institute for Biological Studies. And uh, his today's talk is uh, from the spinal cord to the amygdala, dissecting mm. effective pain pathways. Among many various uh, interests, uh, I think especially the pain related one is uh, uh, a very interesting topic for us. So uh, let's welcome Professor Song Han. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Jung. Such a nice introduction. I, I'm super excited and uh, feel honored to be here to share our recent research and then talk about uh, the, uh, the work that we are doing right now uh, in my lab. So um, as Dr. Jung mentioned, um, I'd like to talk about the pain, but uh, to be honest, I'm not sure whether I'm really the person, um, appropriate person to uh, present in this uh, 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 pre prestigious um, um, uh, lecture because um, I'm studying pain, but I I'm, 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 so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to describe myself as a pain researcher. Uh, rather, I just wanted to say I'm studying a neural circuit that's responsible for uh, multiple and variety of the behaviors uh, that is encoded by the brain. So we are just interested in how sensory information arrives in the brain and how that's also the, the pain is one of the, the modality that we are studying. So, but I mean, I think this is basically just a personal connection between Dr. Chung because uh, Dr. Chung, he, when he had a sabbatical at uh, San Diego, uh, we have a, a very a tight connection and we discuss a lot about uh, the research uh, of pain. So I feel honored to be here. Um, but at the same time, I, I'm really excited and then um, uh, eager to exchanging ideas and discuss about the pain research. And I also want to uh, learn about the, the pain research uh, currently going on in the, uh, in the, the Glypathic Pain Research Center. Um, so. I'm very excited. So I, I um, let me switch the, the the pointer. Okay. So can you guys see the pointer? Okay. So the pain. Um, so according to oh sorry before uh, starting, I just wanted to highlight two uh, wonderful people in my lab, uh, Dr. Sokje Kang, uh, who is a postdoc in my lab and Dr. Shija Liu, who is my first graduate student. So, so this uh, actually, yeah, she uh, actually graduated a few months ago and then she's now a postdoc at uh, the Bernardo Sabatini's lab at Harvard University. And so the most of the work that I am going to share with you guys is done by these two great scientists. So I just wanted to uh, give all the credit to these two people. Okay. So according to the International Association for the Study of Pain, um, the definition of the pain is like this. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential uh, tissue damages. 
So I, ju I just wanted to focus on two things. So pain should be, uh, there, are two, there should be two, two um, modalities. First, um, uh, the sensory information should be perceived, uh, sorry, the, the detected. That can be everywhere in, in, in the brain, uh, sorry, in the, in the body or inside our body. But at the same time, it should be translated and then it, uh, it should be arrived inside the brain because the brain is the, the organ that processes <laughs> and, and translate those sensory information as an experience or as, uh, the emotional, uh, uh, as, a, as a sensory and experience, uh, emotional experiences. So the periphery and central are both important, but I, to, uh, the, in my personal view, uh, I'm more interested in the central uh, aspects of the pain perception because um, I think it's more important than the peripheral perception. For example, uh, I'm wondering whether you guys heard about uh, the pen, uh, phantom limb pain. So the, 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 the people with uh, the amputated uh, amputation, the limb amputation, they still feel pain, um, although the, the source of the pain is actually removed. So for example, you have an amputated arm, but still people feel pain in their uh, lost arm. So indicating that the pain is uh, first uh, perceived, I'm uh, sorry, first, first uh, um, detected by the, the, the periphery, but it should be translated inside the brain. So that's the reason why I'm more interested in the central pain circuit. And uh, another two uh, uh, criteria or characteristic of, of pain is sensory and emotional experience. So pain can be sensory experience, but at the same time, pain is emotional experience. What the sensory experience means is that uh, when you got hurt from your, uh, in your ha uh, hand by like a uh, hammering, um, you know where exactly the, the pain source is com coming from. So it detects where the, the damage comes from and also how serious it is, how intense the pain is. So the sensory uh, aspect of the pain actually encode uh, the information of the location of the pain source and also the, the intensity of the pain source. But at the same time, we, uh, the, the pain actually changes our emotion. It makes, uh, makes us feel really bad. And also it motivates us to avoid the source of the pain. So those two can be dissociated. So um, people uh, just define that there are two, domain of, two domains of the pains. First, uh, sensory um, discri discriminative domain. And the second is effective and motivational. Um, what, what will happen if one aspect of the, the, the pain domain is not functional. So I found one very interesting uh, example from the, the, the movie Simpson. So I just wanted to share the short, short video clip from the Simpsons. Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear the, uh, the, the video? I hope you guys can. No. Uh... Maybe not yet. No, I, I haven't started yet. Can we share? Maybe you click that uh, sharing the, the the sound as well. Okay, but I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't matter. You don't have to uh, get the, uh, the the sound, but you may understand what's going on. Yes. So here we have two research subjects, one hamster and the second a Bart, the human. So the hamster quickly learned the, the electrical shock, which is a pain, painful stimulus. So, and it, it tried to avoid the, the resource. So that, I, that is actually contributed by the perception of effective and motivational domain of pain. But the Bart, he can sense the feeling of electrical shock, but he cannot associate 
that experience as aversive. So he he does not he is not willing to avoid it. He just keep touching it. So this is really a funny situation, but this really happened to human. For example, this is a um, uh, the the poster from from uh, uh, the believe it or not. It's really famous poster uh, the book in in the United States. And there's a one section describing the human uh, the, the neurological symptom called pain asymboria. So what they describe is here. People with the brain condition pain asymbolia do not react normally to pain. It makes them laugh instead. It's kind of a little bit exaggerated uh, expression, but really for some people, they they sense the pain and they actually experience the pain uh, uh, and then they can recognize where the pain comes from, but they cannot associate that event as aversive and then they do not have any motivation to avoid it. Here's the, the research paper. Let me show you, uh, uh, this is just a cartoon, but let me show you the, the, the scientific uh, evidence. So uh, this is a, just a clinical report uh, published like a, several decades ago. Uh, so these, these medical doctors actually descri described exactly the same uh, the, uh, brain condition called asymbolia for pain, a sensory limbic dissociation syndrome. So these people had a, uh, damage in the brain area, including uh, limbic areas like uh, thalamus or amygdala or uh, insular cortex. So those people, what the, this paper is described is here, in the absence of primary sensory deficit, which means the, the sensory perception is perfectly normal, but these sick patients show the lack of withdrawal and absent or inadequate emotional responses to painful stimuli apply over the entire body. So they cannot, they can sense the pain, how intense it is, they know, and then they know where the pain comes from, but they cannot associate that as a worst situation. So they do not have a motivation to avoid that situation. So this is a clear example of the dissociation between sensory versus emotional aspect of the pain. There's another extreme opposite uh, clinical cases here. The title is pain affect without pain sensation in a patient with a post-central lesion. So in this case, there, uh, this, this patient has a damage in the st uh, stomatosensory cortex, which is responsible for processing sensory aspects of the pain. And then this person, um, what happened to the, this person is here. In this patient, we were able to demonstrate First, a dissociation of discriminative and affective component of pain perception. So what happened to this person is this person does not have any uh, sensory uh, perception of the pain. So this person doesn't know where the pain comes from and this person doesn't know how intense or how serious uh, the pain uh, is applied. But interestingly, whenever the experimenter uh, evoke the pain, uh, so the stimulated the person with the, the, the painful stimulus, this person's emotion changes. So this person saying that, oh, there's something uh, very bad things happening, but this person doesn't know what happens. So because uh, there's, a no, there's no visual cue. So this clinical case clearly show that the exactly opposite case. There are some, some people depends on where the brain uh, damage located. Uh, this per, uh, so the people, who cannot perceive the sensory and discriminate, discriminative pain. However, they can normally function on um, affective and motivational pain. So these two extreme cases indicating that there are those the emotional aspect of pain and the, the sensory aspect of pain are, are can be segregated. So um, um, when I started my lab, I, I was really interested in this, uh, this uh, 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 system. So I, I wanted to dissect um, a neural circuit responsible for emotional pain because emotional pain actually contribute a lot of the pain, pain disorder, chronic pain uh, disorders or neurological pain disorders. But the, the problem is 
Um, so we cannot, I mean, I, I'm not a, like a human uh, neuroscientist, so I, I'm not studying like, functional MRI or psychophysics. So my major is just dealing with the, 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 the small, beautiful creature called mice. And then I cannot communicate with mice because mouse cannot understand what I'm saying and the mouse, mouse cannot speak either English or Korean. So we should know what mouse feel, how mouse feels. But uh, so for those two clinical cases, we can just ask people how you feel, but uh, it's basically impossible. So the way uh, people in the pain research are uh, doing is um, developing the, the behavior paradigm. So we indirectly measure the, uh, the pain perception by scoring the, the animal's behavior in response to the, the noxious exposure. One example is a hot plate assay. So we just place the mouse in the hot plate, uh, like five, uh, 55 Celsius hot plate. And then if mouse feel uh, 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 painful, it starts to uh, retract its paw. So we can just record the, how fast mouse retrieve the, the paw. So then we can quantify animal's behavior in response to the thermal uh, noxious stimuli. And we can also study mechanical noxious, uh, mechanical perception of the pain by using um, bone fry assay. So bone fry assay, bone fry is the, the, the name of the scientist who first adapted this uh, technique. Basically, so uh, there, are, there are multiple uh, diameter of the uh, very thin uh, wires. And then uh, the wire actually comes from the bottom to the, the plantar surface of the animals. And then when animals feel uncomfortableness, it actually retreat, retract. So we can calculate uh, the, the, the time duration, uh, time temporal, temporal component. And at, at the same time, we can actually, uh, ca uh, we can actually monitor uh, animals uh, withdrawal score based on different diameters uh, bone fry plummet. So this uh, assay indirectly monitor the mechanical perception of the pain. And we can also study the inflammatory or chemical pain perception using formalin. Formalin, um, uh, if you inject formalin under uh, the, the subcutaneously, it starts to generate the, the inflammation. But before the inflammation, the, it can cause the pain by uh, activating some some uh, chemical re reactive uh, uh, nociceptors, so we can easily monitor uh, animal sensitivity to chemical pain or inflammatory pain by just monitoring uh, how often and how long animals lick its paw. Because licking behavior is an animal's natural response to the pain. So uh, after we inject formalin in the plantar surface, we just basically monitor uh, the behavior behavior of those animals. So how, how long animals lick the paw, the injection site, and how often uh, animal uh, lick the paw. So by calculating this, we can uh, quantify animals uh, behavior on the, the chemical or inflamm inflammatory pain. And there are many other uh, assays developed for um, Neuro, uh, neuropathic pain like the sciatic nerve ligation, uh, or uh, just sometimes we just cut the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the nerves so that it can generate the neuropathic pain. And then uh, one thing that we applied is a, a classical Pavlovian fear conditioning paradigm into the pain field. So Pavlovian fear conditioning used electric push shock as a teaching signal so that animals learn that aversive and uh, uh, noxious environment. So certain times later, if the animal learn, uh, they, they just display defensive behavior or uh, freezing behavior. So by just monitoring freezing, we can calculate animals perception on electric, electric fuchsia, which can be translated as a animated, uh, animal's motivation to avoid uh, noxious uh, stimulus. So these are the things that uh, people, including us, using uh, pain, uh, using mice to to study pain. And then with these uh, these tools, 
we uh, the question that we wanted to dissect is how uh, averse, uh, so nociceptive information goes to the brain. I mean, it's obvious that uh, like a uh, Lina Descartes claimed uh, 400 years ago. So he for, he's the first one who claimed that the pain, uh, the nociceptive information is perceived in the skin, but that information arrives in the brain, and then brain is the the organ that actually translated as a uh, so the the, the 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 locus of the perception. So there should be the 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 wiring that relay the nociceptive information from the from the skin to to the brain. But surprisingly, the neural circuit responsible for those ascending pain pathway is not well uh, studied. We still don't understand fully, especially the the emotional pain circuit, the affective and motivational pain circuit. People uh, don't know where brain in the brain is responsible for those emotional, uh, affective, and motivational pain, and how uh, how how that circuit is formed. So uh, we have that question, and then we decide to pursue uh, that direction. Uh, so it's kind of a little. Uh, so the first thing we, that we did, we basically just label the 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 spinal dorsal horn neurons with the uh, fluorescent protein, and then check where those pro fluorescent protein project to in the brain. So this is simple. However, it's kind of tricky. It's not that simple as we first expected because so the uh, the, the 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 neurons uh, located in the spinal dorsal horn. That is known for the the, the um, projection neurons that relay pain information to the brain. Uh, there are not many markers uh, identified, but the most important, uh, the best known marker is uh, the substance P receptor expressing neurons. Uh, the gene name is TAC, uh, TAC, uh, TACR1, TACR1 gene. But pro the problem is this TACR1 gene is also expressed in the brain. So if we just label these neurons synthetically with a uh, fluorescent protein, um, that can also be labeling uh, the tech r one expressing neuron in the brain. So we cannot distinguish which one is coming, which uh, fluorescent signal comes from the spinal cord and which signal comes from the, the other brain areas. So we need to uh, actually restrict the expression of the fluorescent protein only in the spinal projection neurons. So the way we did is we used the uh, intersectional approach. It's kind of uh, kind of uh, looks like it's really complicated, but uh, the basic idea is the so the red colored fluorescent protein can be expressed under driven by certain uh, enzyme called uh, flip recombinase and uh, create recombinase. Uh, you don't have to understand all these things, but basically. Um, to, for this TD tomato fluorescent protein to be expressed in the spinal dorsal horn neurons, we need two different uh, markers. One uh, expressing the neurons that that label it, that express the the tag R1, uh, the, the the substance P receptor neuron, and second, it should also only be expressed in the spinal cord, not in the brain. So we use two different. Um, uh, report a mouse line, and then cross these two different cross uh, mouse line with uh, the, 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 uh, the, the fluorescent protein encoding uh, report a mouse line. Uh, so it's kind of difficult for, for the people who is outside of uh, the genetics, mouse genetics. But basically, what, what we wanted to try with this complex strategy is that trying to labeling spinal dorsal horn neurons with red fluorescent protein without labeling the brain neurons. Uh, so um, whenever we see the red fluorescent signal in the brain, we can confirm that this red fluorescent signal comes from the spinal cord. And then this is the result. Um, we express um, the, the red, red, red fluorescent protein, TD tomato, in the spinal projection neuron, and then cut the brain section throughout the entire brain, and then found that there are multiple brain area that receive uh, exon terminal input from these uh, the, the spinal projection neurons. 
uh, including posterior thalamus and VPL, VPM, which is trans traditionally known as a sensory thalamus that relay uh, sensory information to the somatosensory cortex. And there's a, there's a, a posterior thalamic area called uh, parvocellular uh, subparapesicular nucleus in uh, abbreviation called SPFP. And there are, there are multiple uh, brain areas in the brain, uh, the midbrain area, like sphere, spheric colliculus, and then uh, periaqueductal gray, and the brainstem parabrachial nucleus, and the modulary uh, DCN, dorsal column nucleus, and the ventrolateral medulla. So these are all previously known as the, uh, the direct recipient brain area that receive uh, spinal input. But among these areas, what we do not know is which brain area is responsible for mediating, uh, relaying emotional, effective motivational pain signals. So our idea is simple. So the, the brain area that's responsible for emotion and uh, the, uh, especially the negative emotion is the amygdala. Uh, everyone understand that, and then everyone agree that amygdala is the emotion center in the brain. So we just check these individual individual brain area whether these brain area actually had a connection with the amygdala. Um, the way we tested is we in, instead of doing real experiments, we just went to the the online database um, provided by Allen Brain uh, Allen Brain Institute. They basically generate the, all the connectivity map in, in mice so that by simply just typing the target brain area and the, uh, the, re, uh, the start, starting brain area, we can actually check whether these two brain area are anatomically connected. And we found among these multiple brain areas, we found two brain areas are directly connected with uh, the amygdala area. One is a parabrachial, lateral parabrachial nucleus, and the second is uh, a parvocellular subparapesicular nucleus. So this is the, the data, the image obtained from the LN mouse brain, connect, mouse brain connectivity atlas. So we didn't do the experiment, but we just searched the database and found that this lateral parabrachial nucleus densely projects to the brain area uh, in, the, in the amygdala, Subnuclei called central nucleus of the amygdala. But interestingly, this SPFP projects to the amygdala, but it's different uh, subnuclei, uh, amygdala subnuclei, uh, including uh, amygdala striatum transition area and the lateral amygdala. And these two projections are largely non overlapped. So it's the, the brainstem parabrachial nucleus that receive pain information directly projects to the central nucleus of the amygdala and the, the, the posterior thalamic SPFP area receive direct information from the spinal dorsal horn neuron and then they project to uh, lateral amygdala and also uh, posterior insular cortex. So we decide to dissect these two areas. And, in, and interestingly, uh, what we found is uh, we found uh, the functional markers in these two areas from, from the Ellen Mouse Brain Atlas, uh, which is the gene named, uh, named uh, calcitonin gene related peptide, CGRP. And CGRP is a, a neuropeptide traditionally known to be expressed in the dorsal root ganglia, uh, the, the primary nociceptor nerves. So it's been well known to relay. Uh, pain information to the spinal projection neuron from, from the, the skin. So it's perfectly makes sense that these neurons, uh, so the, the brain, the central brain area that receive uh, pain input from the spinal cord also uh, expressing the same functional markers. So actually, um, so this, this pathway is already characterized and dissected uh, when I was a postdoc. And then I just uh, reported this uh, pathway as a um, um, uh, effective pain pathway like seven years ago, but this pathway has never been uh, addressed. So 
um, just we wanted to confirm whether these connections uh, is real. So we wanted to test it in our hands. So the way we did is we just um, um, label different colored fluorescent protein in these two brain areas. So the, the parabrachial, uh, brainstem parabrachial nucleus, we label uh, the red, red fluorescent M cherry uh, fluorescent protein and the thalamic SPFP uh, uh, neurons that express EGRP, we uh, express an EYRP. Um, so um, I think some of you guys may uh, not understand the cell type specific uh, uh, method. So the brain is a mixture of lots of different type of neurons. So each different neurons has a different role. So to be able to dissect the brain circuit, it is prerequisite to identify exact the, the specific subtype of neurons. So here we found that uh, the CGRP is the marker. So to study CGRP containing neurons, uh, there, is a, there is a recently developed technique called cell type specific circuit dissections. Basically, there is a way to express certain protein only in the neurons that express uh, CGRP or other, other genes uh, using the, uh, the, the mouse line that express uh, creative combinase in a specific uh, genes. So in this case, we use the mouse line that express creative combinase only in the, uh, the gene named Karka, which express the CGRP. So in this case, we, uh, so, and then injected uh, the virus, uh, adeno-associated virus, pre-dependently encoding these two different fluorescent proteins. So that as a result, um, these proteins are not expressed just uh, other, other, other neurons. These, are, these proteins are only expressed in the neuron that express the query comments. So it's complicated, but you can just explain that, uh, you can just understand that these, these uh, fluorescent protein can only be expressed in the, uh, the CGRP expressing neuron in this, uh, if we use this uh, strategy. And then we just dissected the amygdala area to see whether these neurons project to these areas. And so basically we just check the fluorescent signal. Here you see that the, the, the thalamic SPFP um, CGRP neurons projects to uh, the amygdala area called including lateral amygdala and striatum amygdala transition area. And the parabrachial CGRP neurons only projects to the central nucleus of amygdala in the same angle. And these two are largely, uh, largely uh, segregated, indicating that uh, the C2, there are two different brain areas that express CGRP neurons, a uh, CGRP neuropeptide, but these two brain areas, uh, the neurons in these two brain areas project to the amygdala, but different amygdala subunits. So that's really interesting. And then I, we just wanted to address these circuit more functionally. The first, oh yeah. Uh, and then these neurons project to other brain areas as well. And then uh, the projection patterns are not uh, overlapped with uh, thalamic CGRP neuron and the parabrachial CGRP neurons. So the, uh, the first thing is whether these neurons really receive the, the input from the spinal dorsal horn neurons. So there's a way to test that. There's a, a genetic method called uh, uh, monosynaptic rabies tracing. So rabies is the virus that transgenetically infected. So it actually uh, uh, infected in the, uh, the postsynaptic cells and then it moves to the presynaptic neurons. So using these techniques, we can specifically label the neurons that directly projects to the CGRP neurons. And then we check whether spinal neurons actually projects to these two different brain areas, uh, th different neurons. And then we confirm that uh, uh, these two uh, CGRP expressing neurons receive direct input from the spinal cord by, by observing their, uh, the red fluorescent signals in the, the spinal dorsal horn neurons. And then we confirm that these neurons receive direct input from the spinal cord. And the, the next thing that we did is we monitor the activity of these neurons. If these neurons are really involved in the, the pain processing, uh, we, we can confirm that 
by just monitoring the activity of these neurons. And there's a way to active, uh, monitor the activity of these neurons called calcium imaging. Uh, and then a uh, recent advance of the neuroscience actually developed the genetically encoded uh, protein that detect calcium concentration changes, uh, which is called GCAMP. So GCAMP is a calcium sensor inside the cell, uh, cell body of the, uh, inside the neuron. And then we can change the fluorescent change, uh, we can monitor the fluorescent signal changes by using a method called fiber photometry. So basically we just implant the optic fiber uh, in the specific brain area and check the fluorescent signal uh, in the specific brain area. And in our cases, we just targeted uh, optic fiber tip in the SPFP and also in the parabrachial nucleus. Then we apply the noxious stimuli like uh, uh, the uh, mechanical or uh, thermal stimuli. And as you see here, uh, mechanical stimuli intensity dependently increase the calcium activity, indicating that these neurons are activated by mechanical stimulus. And the, the, the thermal stimuli also activate these neurons, but interestingly, for the thermal stimuli, it's only activated by aversive uh, temperature, like uh, 55 degrees Celsius. The just normal uh, ambient temperature, like 25, 35, 45, these neurons are not activated. These neurons are only activated by hot temperature, but the mechanically, they are just gradually, their activity is gradually increased as we gradually increase the mechanical uh, intensity. And then we also tested uh, activity of these neurons in response to the, uh, the inflammatory and chemical pain. So, As I explained previously, so we can monitor the chemical and inflammatory pain behavior by injecting uh, formalin yeah. in the animal's paw. So we, as we injected formalin in their paw, these neurons, the, the SPRP, CGRP neurons are robustly activated, indicating that these neurons are receiving the uh, pain information uh, like a mechanical or thermal or chemical information. We just performed the same thing with the parabrachial CGRP neurons. And then as you see, uh, these parabrachial CGRP neurons are also activated, robustly activated by uh, uh, the, the, the mechanical stimuli or thermal stimuli, as well as the uh, um, chemical and inflammatory uh, stimuli. So all these data are indicating that these neurons are activated in response to uh, noxious stimuli, indicating that they might be involved in um, uh, noxious information processing. But we still don't know whether these are really the, uh, the effective pain circuit. So to test causality, whether these neurons are really required for the, the pain perception, we actually in inactivated these neurons. So to test the causality, the, the easiest way is just to basically inactivate neural activity so that we can see, uh, we see whether uh, inactivation blocks the, the behavior change induced by the pain. So we uh, inactivated these uh, neurons in the thalamus and the uh, brainstem uh, area that express CGRP by expressing a bacterial toxin called tetanus toxin. So this tetanus toxin does not kill the neuron, but it basically silences the neurotransmission. So, uh, okay, and then we monitor uh, the pain perception behavior, pain behavior by formal test or uh, uh, fear conditioning test. The reason why we chose these two tests is because uh, formal test and the fear conditioning is the behavior essay that can indirectly monitor the affective and motivational aspect of the pain. And as you see here, um, inactivation of these, these neurons by tetanus toxin substantially reduce the behavior, uh, leaking behavior of animals uh, by inactivating SPFP CGRP neurons or parabrachial CGRP neurons, indicating that uh, these neurons are necessary for uh, inflammatory or uh, the, uh, the pain perception. So with the same group of animals, we perform the uh, Pavlovian fear conditioning. And then as you see here, the animals freezing behaviors after the conditioning 
uh, animals uh, like in 24 hours when we uh, test uh, animals freezing behavior we see that there's a substantial reduction of the freezing indicating that animals motivation to deal with uh, the painful stimuli is also decreased so we just concluded that these results indicate that uh, effective and motivational pain, uh, uh, these DGRP expressing neurons are important for effective and motivational pain perception. Then if these neurons are really encoding aversion or, uh, mo sorry, the, the encoding effective and motivational pain, um, we wanted to test what happened if we activate these neurons. I, I guess everyone uh, uh, heard about the uh, optogenetics. So we can activate the neural neurons using the, the light. So to, to do it, we cell type specifically express the opto, uh, optogenetic actuator called the channel one opsin in the CGRP mouse, uh, the CGRP neuron in the thalamus and also in the, uh, the parabrachial nucleus, and then monitor um, animals aversive, uh, aversion behavior in the paradigm called real-time place preference test. So basically, uh, we animal can choose two, two chambers. And in one chamber, the laser light is on. So in that case, these neurons are activated. So if these neurons are encoding uh, aversive information, then animal feel bad and they need to immediately avoid that situation. So we can we can check animals' uh, balance, uh, uh, animals' uh, aversive behavior by monitoring how long animals stay in each chamber. And as you see here, um, the laser on chamber, the time, animals' time is spent in the stimulated chamber is significantly decreased, indicating that animals do not want to stay in that area. They just want to avoid. And at the same time, uh, the same, same observation is also observed in the, uh, in the animals that express CGRP, uh, CH, CHR2 in the parabrachial CGRP, indicating that activation of these neurons make the animal feel bad and it just uh, induce uh, avoidance. Okay, then uh, as in our, uh, one of the first slides, we show that these two CGRP expressing population projects to the amygdala layer. So we wanted to test whether these projections are really important for uh, um, for uh, <laughs> effective and motivational pain perception. So um, we did the similar things. In this case, instead of activating cell body, we activated exon terminal of the neurons that projects to the amygdala layer. In that case, we confirm that the, uh, the projection from the thalamus or parabrachial nucleus to the amygdala areas is responsible for those avoidance behavior. And as you see here, um, the terminal stimulation can also make the animal avoid, indicating that this circuit is actually the disconnection from the thalamus to the lateral amygdala and the brainstem to the central amygdala is mediating uh, aversive information generated by uh, uh, the pain, uh, the nociceptive information. Yeah, so in conclusion, um, so we, our data suggests that CGRP neurons in the brainstem parabrachial nucleus and then thalamic SPRP neurons receive direct monosynaptic input from the spinal projection, dorsal bone projection neurons that is known to relay uh, pain information, uh, nociceptive information to the brain. And second, the parabrachial CGRP neuron and the SPRP CGRP neurons send the external terminal to the amygdala nuclei the parabrachial neurons send the signal to the CEA, and SPFP uh, neurons send the signal to the lateral amygdala. And the CGRP, parabrachial CGRP neuron and, and SPFP CGRP neurons are robustly activated by noxious thermal, mechanical, and chemical stimuli. And inhibition of these neurons, specifically attenuated, oh, 
I actually didn't show the data that uh, these neurons actually do not, uh, th th these neurons are not important for sensory and uh, discriminative pain. So there are sensory discrimin discriminative pain assays like the hot plate assay or bone fry assay. And then these assays, uh, manipulating these neurons to, does not change the animal's perception. So we concluded that these uh, circuits are specifically uh, wired to relay nociceptive information to the amygdala so that it actually uh, responsible for uh, affective and motivational uh, pain uh, relay to the brain. And activating these neurons encode aversion and aversive memories. So uh, these results indicating that uh, the CGRP neurons in the thalamus and the parabrachian nucleus uh, is necessary and sufficient for relaying uh, effective and motivational pain from the spinal cord to the amygdala layer. Uh, I have another thought, but I don't think it's necessary for here. So I, I would like to stop here and then um, maybe we can discuss um, the, the further, but it's kind of complicated, looks, looks complicated, but what I wanted to say uh, with this uh, case study is that, so until recently, we didn't know which brain area is important for relaying uh, emotional pain to the amygdala. And then by doing this uh, circuit dissection study, we were able to pinpoint the brain area that relay um, effective and motivational uh, pain to the amygdala area. So uh, we think that these, these circuits are important for chronic pain or neuro, uh, neuropathic pain, uh, such as um, migraine or um, uh, other uh, uh, neuro neurological pain disorders. So uh, it's kind of complicated. It looks complicated to the people who is outside the circuit dissection field, but just wanted to persuade you guys that uh, we just found the brain area that relaying um, pain information to the amygdala so that it forms um, emotional pain circuit, which is different from sensory pain circuit. Uh, so I would like to thank my lab members, especially uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Sokje Gang and Dr. Shija Liu. Uh, and other lab members. And I'd like to thank my funding sources uh, that makes us to study these uh, projects. Thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sohan. <laughs> I, I think it was a very interesting, interesting talk and very thorough one. Uh, uh, before we turn into our discussion session, I yep. just wanted to uh, ask uh, one more topic uh, from you because I do remember you have done a fascinating study of how uh, opioid has the effect on the breathing. And that's one of the motivation for why we have initiated our um, this uh, chronic pain and intractable pain project because it become a social and uh, social burden to US and uh, maybe even South Korea. So I guess maybe you can just uh, explain about the, the problem of uh, uh, breathing depression by use of overuse of opioid that has become a huge uh, uh, problem in the pain field. So it would be great if you can kind of uh, explain those stories just uh, maybe verbally. Oh, definitely, definitely. So let me switch the, so I actually have a, a like a 10 minute slide for that topic. So since we have enough time, maybe I can just uh, uh, just introduce um, that topic. Yeah, I think that would be okay. Awesome. Sure. So there are lots of painkillers. There are lots of painkillers like uh, uh, Tylenol, Ibuprofen, but these are not actually the painkillers. They are actually anti-inflammatory drugs. So there's only one 
uh, targets uh, currently available uh, for uh, pharmacology, pharmacologically uh, alleviate the, uh, the pain uh, perception. That's the, the opioid, opioid receptor. So the opioid receptor anta uh, antagonist, oh, sorry, opioid receptor agonist is the only uh, chemical that neurologically suppress the pain perception. So other painkillers are not really the painkiller. They just the anti-inflammatory things. But, but like bicodine or morphine or fentanyl or uh, uh, like a, uh, what's that? Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of drugs that actually centrally acting, the CNS, CNS acting pain medicines, there are, all of them are targeting the mu opioid receptor. So um, that's the most effective uh, pain medication. However, it can cause huge problem. Basically, people die by taking opioid medication. And also, uh, it's it, because of its highly addictive nature, um, so a lot of people got addicted by the, the, the painkiller, like by or uh, uh, the opioid derivative uh, drugs. So, it's huge social economic burden in the United States um, because of that. So, um, okay, can you guys see the slide? Sure. Okay. Okay, as I mentioned, so the so that kind of uh, that uh, situation people call opioid crisis. So last year, more than 100,000 people died by opioid overdose. So this, that's actually more, uh, the, so it, more people died by opioid than car accidents in the United States. So that's a huge problem. And then it's rapidly increased because of the, the, the chemical called fentanyl. Fentanyl is really uh, easily synthesizable drugs and then China and other develop, developing country synthesized lots of uh, the, the fentanyl derivatives and then they actually uh, exported that to, to the United States. So that actually trigger and facilitate the, the addiction and uh, overdose death in the United States. So it's, um, so, but surprisingly, little is known why uh, the me neural mechanism by which uh, opioid drugs kill people. And then we know that the, the, the um, opioid um, drugs, uh, so the mu opioid receptor highly expressed in the, the, the brain's breathing center. And the mu opioid receptor is a GI cox receptor. So it inhibits the neural activity. So in the presence of the agonist, mu, mu opioid receptor agonist, it suppresses the activity of the breathing center neurons so that people uh, slow down breathing and then uh, the, the, it eventually it stopped breathing. So that, that's the reason why people die by opioid. So uh, we just wanted to dissect the neural circuit response for that. And then we found that in the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, the, among those three breathing centers in the animals, uh, the pontine respiratory group, actually this is the same area as I mentioned in previous uh, topic called parabrachial nucleus. And this parabrachial nucleus uh, highly expressed the mu opioid receptor encoding genes. So we just targeted this area, it might be responsible for uh, opioid overdose death. And then we tested it and then uh, using sophisticated method. And then we confirmed that um, here, morphine injection actually inactivate these neurons so that it dramatically decreased breathing rhythm, but by artificially activating, reactivating these neurons, we can actually rescue the breathing rhythm. So our hypothesis is really correct. So these parabrachial uh, mu opioid receptor ne expressing neurons are responsible for opioid mediated breathing depression. And then opioid suppress the neural activity so that if we reactivate by artificial manipulation or a certain mm -hmm. way, then we may be able to rescue the, the breathing. 
so that we can actually uh, rescue uh, people from from dying by opioid. So and then, but this is an artificial manipulation. So we just try to find a way to naturally uh, targeting these neurons so that naturally activating these neurons. The way we did is we just uh, analyzed uh, total transcription uh, tr uh, the, the the messenger RNAs that specifically expressed in these neurons, and then found multiple G protein coupled receptors that can potentially activate these neurons. So we just uh, narrow down a few G protein coupled receptors that activate these neurons, and then we actually tested whether these the agonists of these uh, G protein coupled receptors can rescue the breathing. And among five, five candidates, we found that the natural ligand, uh, not natural ligand, the so just pharmacological treatment of these, uh, uh, the agonists for these receptors can reliably rescue the breathing rhythm that was suppressed by the morphine, indicating that. So we basically just provided a, a theoretical uh, uh, framework that by activating these neurons using uh, pharmacological uh, intervention, we may be able to rescue opioid induced respiratory depression. So one of the uh, candidates are is uh, the the 5-HT2A, the serotonin receptor, and also the CCK1R and NK1R. So NK1R is actually the the, the receptor that I mentioned previously that expressed substance P receptor. So so these are just the uh, 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 the receptors that specifically expressed in the parabrachial mu opioid expressing neurons. So by activating these neurons, uh, we can rescue the, the breathing uh, depression induced by the opioid drugs. So uh, we hope that this might, these uh, agonists of these, these receptors might be a uh, starting point to develop uh, the medication that rescued of uh, opioid uh, depression and opioid overdose deaths. Um, yeah, so, uh, but the, the problem is, so problem is parabrachial nucleus is also, as I mentioned previously, parabrachial nucleus is also important for the pain perception. So these, these brain areas relay the pain. So if we activate these, these brain areas to rescue uh, uh, breathing depression, uh, the patient may feel more pain. So that's a huge dilemma. So to rescue the breathing uh, depression, we need to somehow activate <clears throat> uh, the pain relaying areas. So then maybe there, these, these brain areas might not be a good uh, target to develop um, uh, safe medication. So to, we just further dissected whether there's a, a the single neuron encode both pain and breathing depression phenotype, or there uh, there are segregation of different neurons responsible for breathing depression and the pain perception. If the latter case is uh, uh, correct, uh, it, it, rather case if there's a latter case is right, then we may be able to dissect those two different populations and then find the functional marker that selectively target only one area, uh, one, one type of neuron that uh, is responsible for breathing depression or maybe pain perception. So um, with complicated analysis, what we found is that, the, so there are mixtures of the opioid receptor expressing neuron in the parabrachial nucleus, but interestingly, some neurons only project to the modulary pre single complex, which is traditionally known to known as the breathing center. So these are the, the this, this is the brain area that control the breathing. So some some opi uh, op opioid receptor neurons only projects to the breathing center uh, in the in the, the modular area, but some neurons projects to the central nucleus of the amygdala that's responsible for pain perception. And interestingly, these two are not overlapped and makes interesting anatomical uh, formation for core and shell configuration. So the core opioid receptor neurons projects to 
the central nucleus of the amygdala, and then it relay pain information to the amygdala, as I mentioned in the previous uh, topic. However, the shell neurons, they are not projecting to the amygdala, but it projects to the pre-single complex, which is responsible for breathing. So we have a hope <laughs> that we may be able to uh, specifically target certain population so that we can specifically block the breathing depression or we can specifically block the pain perception without changing the breathing. So in case of the morphine, if we inject the morphine or uh, like a uh, bicodine or uh, opioid agonist, so that binds to both population so that it suppress the breathing and it also suppress the pain perception. So that it's not a good drug and, and it basically eventually generate the uh, breathing depression, which leads to death. However, if we specifically target these population, uh, sorry, I actually, if we specifically target this population, then we may be able to develop uh, uh, analgesic that's not changing the breathing rhythm. So it's safe analgesic. Or alternatively, if we target uh, if we find the functional marker that specifically changes the activity of these neurons without changing these neurons, then we may be able to uh, uh, find the drug that uh, selectively rescue the breathing without changing the pain perception. So this is our current uh, uh, direction. So we are trying to uh, isolate these two different populations. And then we just try to uh, collect the messenger RNA, the total total uh, transcriptome of each neurons so that we can uh, just uh, find specific markers that is exclusively expressed in this population or exclusively expressed in this population. So that from that point, we may be able to find the functional marker that selectively modulate breathing or selectively modulate the pain perception. So that's uh, our current uh, aim. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think these are the things that I already explained. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Han. Uh, I think that, that was also wonderful. So yeah, I can, my approach is just to, to introduce case study how uh, uh, we study pain pathway. However, I kind of regret because it might be a little too much for some people who is not in this field. So I kind of apologize for that, but I just, I hope you guys just get some, some basic idea that uh, we found a brain areas that's responsible for mediating or relaying uh, emotional components of the pain to the amygdala. And then we also found that uh, uh, actually different mu opioid receptor population is doing different behaviors like changing behavior of breathing and uh, relaying the pain signal to the amygdala so that we can actually uh, provide the theoretical evidence that those two uh, phenotype induced by opioid can be segregated so that we can specifically target spe uh, breathing or pain so, mm -hmm. which provide the, the, the a stepping stone to develop uh, a side effect free analgesics or a cure for opioid overdose. That's basically what we wanted to, uh, what I wanted to address mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in today's talk. Uh, you don't have to uh, remember those jargons and complicated methods, but I just wanted to, I hope that you guys understand. I just ha have in mind that there's a specific brain area and a specific top population of neurons that relay emotional aspect of the pain and also the opioid uh, uh, can be actually, so uh, uh, yeah, so the neuro circuit wise, the breathing suppression and the pain perception can be segregated. So that's the, mm -hmm. uh, the key of the talk. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Again, uh, thank you for the bonus lecture as well. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, I think we have a few uh, questions in the chatting. So maybe can you go through this uh, 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 written questions uh, before we get into uh, uh, more? Of course, of course. Okay, so uh, let me just rephrase the, the first question. Yeah. Okay. So uh, from, uh, from Young Kim, I yes. wonder if any of those patients with affective pain disorders ever gain their lost functions back afterwards. Oh, uh, sorry, I don't know. So I just read a case study. So I, I didn't follow up those case studies. Um, but I think these are, so, the, so, so at least for those cases, it's permanent damage by, by cancer or, or uh, 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 the lesion by the epileptic uh, uh, encephalopathy. So basically they just try to remove the, the, the starting point of the epilepsy. So it's just permanent, permanent damage, not reversible. That's what I understood. And the second question is, were there any long-term studies? I, I mean, that's a great question, but I don't know. I don't have an answer for this. Mm -hmm. And third, and if so or not, wonder if these synaptic functions, both input and output, can be diverted or threshold differentially. What would be your uh, inklings? Yeah, I think definitely, um, for example, um, migraine. So migraine, uh, just people, some people believe that migraine is a peripheral pain disorder, but there's definitely the central components, like the migraine patients are hypersensitive to the sensory cue. So normal sensory information can be aversive to the migraine patient. Sometimes those sensory information can trigger the migraine. So uh, sensory hypersensitivity cannot be explained by the peripheral uh, signaling. So definitely migraine patient had a problem inside the brain as well as outside the brain. So we believe that this uh, CCRP pathway might be contributing uh, hypersensitivity to the migraine patient. And also there's a uh, another neurological disorder called, um, uh, I forgot the name, but sometimes pain generalization. So the gen so sometimes in intense pain can generalize the perception of the pain and that might be explained. So the plasticity build up in the center pain, uh, center circuit so that even uh, the, the, the outside the locus of the, the initial pain uh, generating locus, maybe their normal pain signal comes to the brain and then that, uh, that uh, plastic brain circuit can actually exacerbate the original normal sensory perception so that people may be able to perceive normal sensory signal as a aversive or uh, so the painful event. So definitely the central uh, emotional pain circuit can contribute a long-term or a chronic uh, or generalization, uh, pain generalization. Uh, and then we actually studied. So we just repeated, injected, repeatedly injected uh, the formalin and checked the plasticity change of these neurons and the connections and found that the, the repeated formalin injection can develop the, the plasticity. So it's possible that the central, uh, the threshold and the, uh, those can be changed by, by long-term events. I'm not sure whether that's the answer for the, the question. Okay, then the second, the first one is, is the CGRP neuron only candidate or any other uh, candidates? Uh, interestingly, the CGRP neurons are expressing multiple neuropeptides like uh, uh, the pituitary adenine cyclase uh, a peptide called P P -A -C -A -P. And PACAP is also the target for the migraine. And the substance P is also expressed in these neurons. So um, I cannot say that this is the only uh, population, but this might be uh, one of the uh, one of the population that constitutes the uh, the central pain pathway that relay pain information to the amygdala area. Mm -hmm. And if I could modulate the pain only rather than breathing, I would fly to. <laughs> uh, to Colombia now and uh, start baking powers right away <laughs> for Kenazizis. Oh, so this is not a question. Okay, 
Yeah, I yeah I also think that this is really important question, and then because of that, the NIH uh, actually funded uh, like planned to fund our study. So hopefully, we may be able to uh, generate some some interesting um, um, uh, uh, data that eventually contribute um, um, human human. Um, humans, uh, the, 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 the opioid overdose. But the problem is we cannot still solve the addiction. Uh, so some of the people actually ask the question, if we develop um, a safer analgesic that does not touch the, the breathing, but it may still cause the uh, addictive uh, behavior. So then people may get easily addicted. <laughs> That may actually facilitate addiction. But uh, in a separate study, we are also uh, investigating. Um, uh, sorry, I investigating your circuit responsible for opioid mediated addiction and the pain perception. So hopefully, we may be able to answer that question as well. Okay, okay. Um, I think that's the thing that I, I covered. Uh, you guys have any questions, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so far, I, I think now we may change our ways. Uh, so it was like English based, but we know that you are Korean. So I think it would be easier and more free for us to use Korean to ask and discuss. Definitely. A little more for the remaining time. Yeah, 